Hello friends, welcome back to the diabetes lectures. Today I'm going to discuss you about insulin pumps, uh, continuous glucose monitoring and diacent. So my name uh, is Santosh Abraham. I'm a, working as a specialist registrar in Scarborough General Hospital in the Department of Diabetes and Endocrinology. So here I will give you a basic info knowledge about the insulin pump. So an insulin pump is a small device and it gives regular insulin throughout the day and night. So there are two types actually. You have a tethered uh, pump and a patch pump. Both these are attached to the skin, uh, I mean to your body, uh, through a tiny tube called cannula. And uh, in the tethered pump you need to uh, change the cannula. So a tethered pump is connected to your body by another small tu tu tube that's called the cannula. And the pump has all the controls. And it can be carried on your belt, in a pocket or in a body band. And uh, it has called screens, uh, it has got a screen, um, it has got remotes, even some of them has got Bluetooth remotes. But pa patch pumps, you can put them directly on your body. Uh, uh, with the cannula and then uh, you can put it on your legs, arms or stomach. They have no this extra extra tubing actually so pump is sitting directly on your skin and it works using uh, it, uh, it works by using a remote. and patch pumps are disposable pumps and you will need to change the whole device but in case of tethered pump you just need to replace the infusion set so the base this is the basic diagram of uh, an uh, of a pump so you you see the tubing here and it carries the insulin and there is the reservoir connector here and it helps to connect the tube with the reservoir and then you have the inserting section here in 3 like w which is get getting attached to the body and you have the cannula it's a tube uh, that is placed into your body by an insertion needle and then you have the adhesion on to the inserting side and then you have the reservoir compartment which holds the reservoir what type of insulin is used in, in insulin pump so they use rapid acting insulin such as Lispro, Aspart and Glulicin Longer acting insulins are not necessary because the pump is always delivering small amounts of insulin every few minutes. And what are the advantages? It gives you increased flexibility in lifestyle. The insulin de the delivery is predictable and the insulin delivery is very precise. Hypoglycemia is reduced. The episodes of uh, hyperglycemia is really reduced and the glycemic variability of the fluctuations in glucose is reduced. Disadvantages are you can have a skin infection at the catheter site. If the pump gets blocked or it malfunctions you can have a DKA. So uh, more about the benefits and limitations. The benefits are less hypoglycemia and improved hypoglycemia awareness reduced glucose variability, better HbA1c values, decreased insulin requirements, flexible precise insulin measurements to allow accurate basal and boluses and improved quality of life. The limitations are it's expensive so the cost, there could be infections at the infusion site, there's a risk of DKA, sometimes you could have a psychological feeling that you always attach or dependent on the pump and when you need to remove the pump that could be a problem for those patients and also it needs a lot of 
മോട്ടിവേഷൻ കോമ്പിറ്റൻസി ട്രെയിനിങ് ആൻഡ് യുനോ ആൻ എ ലോങ്ങിങ് ടു നോ ആൻഡ് ലേൺ വെരി റയർലി റെറ്റിനോപ്പതി ഗുഡ് വേഴ്സൺ ഓർ പ്രോഗ്രസ് ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് ദി യുനോ ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് ദി ഇംപ്രൂവ്ഡ് ലൈഫ് ഇൻ കൺട്രോൾ so the contraindications are if the patient or the carer is unable to participate in the care of the pump like if they are not mentally competent if unconscious confused or incapacitated such as in illness or pain when we cannot do the self management dk is a definite contraindication in surgical procedures for the team wants to switch off to vrri then patients are at risk of self harm or suicide and if it is not in the best interest of the patient and lack of availability of infusion sets batteries or other equipment equipment for the pumps so as in the basal bolus insulin treatment here the here also the basal means a background insulin that is delivered continuously in tiny doses throughout the day that is 24 into 7 and the basal is a fast acting insulin unlike the basal bolus we use in the standard insulin therapy where the basal is a long acting so in pumps always the basal is the same insulin which you use for uh, bolus as well so that will be the fast acting insulin and there is a bolus insulin to cover for the meals and to correct high blood sugar let's you uh, know uh, come to see what nice tells about eligibility of getting a pump so in type 1 diabetes for adults and children about 12 years nice recommends pumps in these cases if attempts to reach hba1c with multiple daily injections resulting in the patient having disabling hypoglycemia so one of the indications is in type 1 diabetes for adults and children about 12 years if there is disabling hypoglycemia when trying for the optimal glucose control or if their hba1c is above 8.5 8.5 or above and with multiple daily injections despite the person carefully trying to manage their diabetes so if you have multiple injections for children under 12 years with type 1 diabetes they don't usually recommend and children who use the pump should have a trial of multiple daily injections between the age and 12 and 18 between the age of 12 and 18 you need to know what di- disabling hypoglycemia is this is when hypoglycemic op- episodes occur frequently or without warning that is without the awareness so that the patient is constantly anxious about another episode occurring and this has a negative impact on the quality of life and this is called disabling hypoglycemia so this is another uh, slide which shows the um, nice guidelines so you have to undergo a trial of uh, mdi between the age of 12 and 18 years and pumps are uh, indicated when the mdi is considered to be impractical or in- inappropriate and this should be initiated by a tra- trained specialist team for example in our hospital we have a pump nurse and we have got a pump clinic and our criteria is like if the type 1 diabetes patients require more than 8 finger sticks per day we usually recommend them for the pump although nice guidelines say uh, more than 10 10 or more than 10 finger pricks so it varies from trust to trust so this team will be a physician who is interested in insulin pump therapy a diabetes specialist nurse and a dietitian and it this involves a structured education program and advice on diet lifestyle and exercise for people on pumps and pumps should be continued only if there is a sustained improvement in glycemic control 
as showed by a fall in HbA1c levels or a sustained decrease in rate of hypoglycemic episodes. If the patient is not achieving this, there is no benefit in uh, putting him or her on the pump therapy. And uh, pump is not at all recommended for treatment of patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Even patient with secondary diabetes or you know patients having diabetes as a result of the pancreatitis or pancreatitis, the pumps are not currently in the guidelines. So pump is all, always only approved for patients who are with type 1 diabetes. So there is an initial pump uh, calculator, I mean there is a pump calculator so that calculates the initial pump requirements. So the pump usually will require about 80% of the insulin requirements at the start. That is if you are using say uh, 20 units, you might of insulin on a, in a day, you will need only 16 units in the pump and 50% of this insulin, let's say if you are using 16 units. 8 unit will be given as the basal and the 8 will be given as 3 uh, three meal boluses if you are taking regularly 3 meals. So here is a um, calculation again if you are requiring 30 units. So you need 24 units if you are transitioned to, to the pump. So that is 24 units and this 24 unit uh, is split into 12 basal and 12 bolus. And if you are taking 3 meals a day, this bolus is again divided by 3 and you get the 4 units. So 4 units will be the premier bolus and 12 units will be the basal. And the 12 units is given over 24 hours. So the basal rate is 0.5 units per hour. Also we need to know about dawn phenomenon. In some patients with diabetes, they have very stable levels of insulin circulating plasma insulin and blood glucose levels overnight and between 2 to 8 the plasma insulin levels increase because of the uh, GH circulating growth hormone and this causes the release of glucose and increased insulin resistance but this automatic increase in insulin secretion is impossible in people with diabetes so the glucose will go up because there is no insulin and you can see a noticeable rise in the blood glucose during this time, overnight time period. So if you are using the pump and you are having the down phenomenon, it is easier to counteract this with the pump because the basal rates can be adjusted depending on any, I mean on any time you can adjust the basal rates. So the down phenomenon can often be counteracted with the basal increase of 20 to 30 percent usually. So what you do is that on uh, when a uh, patient is on the insulin pump and they have uh, exhibiting the dawn phenomenon, the basal rates are decrease are increased during that period. So this prevents this rise in glucose. And if you have a dawn phenomenon, the recommendation is to change basal rates two to three hours prior to the rise in glucose. another graphical representation of a dawn phenomenon. So you have a constant basal rate here and you have a variable basal rate here. So in the constant basal rate the blood sugars you can see peaked but when you give the variable basals that is the basal is adjusted you can see it is almost nearing the control level. You need to differentiate this from the Somogi effect, but there is, when you are going to sleep, your blood sugar is in range, but then there is an undetected hypoglycemia. And as a result of the undetected hypoglycemia, there is a rebound in the blood glucose. So the morning glucose is elevated. If you graphically see uh, Dawn phenomenon and Somogi effect, it, it looks like this because the in the dawn phenomenon cortisol and GH causes this 
rise in blood sugar where in the somogia effect you have the low blood glucose sugar and there is a rebound in addition to the basal and the bolus rate you can have set a temporary basal rate in special situations so the temporary basal rate could be an increase in your basal rate or a decrease in bas basal rate for a period of time it is not automatic i mean the pump cannot know when you need increased or decreased basals so you have to choose how much basal insulin you want and for how long and you need to time your pump so you might need in uh, more insulin in exercise sorry less insulin exercise so you might need to decrease uh, your temporary basal rate maybe you might need to increase in illness or depending on how you change so the temporary basal rate will always help you to prevent hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia these are the insulin pumps uh, usually used in the uk approved by nhs so you have the accucheck both are from roche you have the medtronics mini med and mini med 640g mini med paradigm vo and mini med 640g and you have the omniport which is also very fairly common here and you have the uh, dana ones and you have the uh, cell novo and the a6 by metro and insulin pumps with integrated cgms are metronics mini med 640g paradigm vo animas vibe with dexcom sensors the mini med 640 and paradigm have got an advanced feature that will switch off the insulin delivery if blood sugars become too low so this will shorten the hypo and prevent severe hypos so this is only for the metronic pumps nicest recently uh, you know endorsed the use of paradigm vo pumps that is uh, this one and with cgm sensors for people on insulin therapy that are ha having problems with regular or unexpected hypos and what are the different bolses there are three different types of bolses one is a standard bolus one is an extended bolus and one is a multi wave bolus standard bolus is usually which we give with a normal meal composed of carbohydrates fat and protein and this is adjusted to the carbohydrate units of the meal and the initial blood sugar level and it is given all at once if the bolus is correct the insulin re released will lower the blood sugar and it will prevent the spikes it's also called standard bolus or scroll bolus with accucheck normal or express bolus with paradigm and or standard bolus or visual express bolus with the deltec now what's in a delayed or extended bolus when we have more fat in the meal it delays the absorption of carbohydrates into the blood stream one example is pizza and also in other dishes like lasagne french fries tiramisu etc if it contains even pulses so if the complete bolus is released all at once this will lead to hypo because the insulin is already at work but the carbohydrates have not arrived in the blood stream but after 4 to 5 hours there will be a sharp rise in the blood glucose blood sugar because of the carbohydrates now getting into the blood stream but there is no insulin because you have delivered the insulin all at once so thus the standard bolus will fail in this case when you are having a food with more fat content so to prevent that or to solve that issue we have got a different kind of bolus which is delivered in small quantities over an extended period that's called the delayed or extended bolus and there is another bolus the third bolus is the multi wave or dual bolus if your blood sugar level before a meal is too high and requires adjustment in this case you know the insulin pump first delivers the corrective dose and it lowers the blood sugar then it is followed by a delayed bolus and it can be selected and it will correct the further glycemic load so you here you can see the blue line here is the basal rate and then 
you are having a breakfast and then you give the bolus. So the insulin pumps graphs will look like this. You have the basals and then you have the boluses. The standard bolus is a single peak, whereas the dual bolus is like uh, you give one and then you have an extended release. Then you have the short extended and the long extended bolus depending on the food you are taking. You can see that the extended bolus is the insulin is given on a, it doesn't peak but it, it acts for a long time. So uh, especially when there is more fat which delays the absorption of carbohydrate. And this is another example of multiple boluses where you snack in between and then you give boluses so as to correct it. So but that is not a very healthy practice. So when you see this graph from Diascent or any other CGM uploaders uh, which is synchronized with the pump, you can see how fairly the glucose control is for that patient. Another graphical exp uh, expression is uh, of the three boluses are like this. You have the standard bolus, you have a dual wave bolus for just an extension and then you are have an extended bolus which is also called a square wave bolus. Now what we have to do when the patient is in admitted with an insulin pump. So if it is critically ill, you need to give the IV insulin infusion, so you need to stop the pump. If the patient is undergoing long surgical procedure, more than two hours, again transition to IV insulin. If it's a short procedure, you can continue the insulin pump. And if the patient is non-critically ill, if they can operate the pump, continue. But if they cannot operate, you have to go to the basal bolus. And in X-ray and CT, pump should be covered by the lead apron. If you're doing the MRI, pump and metal infusion set should be removed because that will interfere with the MRI. In ultrasound, you don't need to remove the pump, but the transducer should not be placed over the pump. And in cardiac cath, just like the X-ray, you can the pump could be covered by the lead apron. Also in a pacemaker and automatic ICD, you don't need to remove the pump. It could be covered by the lead apron. In colonoscopy and in laser surgery, the pump need not need to be removed. The pump needs not not to be removed. And what are the contraindications of insulin pump therapy in detail in the hospital? If there is impaired level of consciousness, if they cannot uh, do the alter the pump settings, if there is a critical illness requiring ICU intensive care, if there is psychiatric illness and the patient cannot manage, if there is decay or HHS, if the patient cannot participate in the self-care, if the pump supplies are lacking, I mean if there are no pump supplies in the hospital, if there are no trained healthcare providers in the hospital, if the patient is at risk for suicide and also in the best interest of the patient. How do you transition, how do you move from the pump to the subcutaneous regime? That's all, also called the pump holiday protocol. So you need to stop pump after the basal insulin is given for two hours. Like you give the basal insulin prior to, two, uh, prior to stopping the pump, two hours prior to stopping the pump. And you calculate the 24 basal dose of insulin delivered from the pump setting. This basal can be given as a once daily or twice daily injection. And prandial insulin is the total uh, dose of insulin divided by 3. I mean half of the patient's total dose divided by 3. And you need to monitor the blood sugars. This is the uh, correction dose algorithm and it is uh, based on the blood glucose and the patient's insulin sensitivity factor or by a sliding scale. So if the glucose is less than 10, you don't need to give it. But then you might need more insulin as shown here, like if it is between 10 and 12, you need 1. If it is between 12 and 14, you need 2. If it is between 14 and 16, you need 3. If it 
it's between 16.1 and 18 you need 4 like that so you j just need to know roughly when you transition to the basal bolus and then um, if you need additional insulin requirements because you need to remember that the pump needs only 80% of the basal bolus regime so you might need to increase it when you are transitioning back so for short surgeries with less than 2 hours you need to monitor the blood glucose if the blood glucose is less than 100 you need to hold it hold the basal if it is between 101 and 140 decrease it by 25 percent if it is between 141 and 180 you can continue the basal rate but if it is going up if it is between 181 and 220 that is it is between 10.1 and 12.2 you need to increase by 25 percent if it is more than 220 you need to increase 25 to 50 percent also also and also you need to give a bolus insulin now coming to the CGMs CGM stands for continuous glucose monitoring so it is a device used for monitoring blood glucose for it could be used in either type 1 or type 2 diabetes currently we use Libre freestyle Libre in our trust and it is approved only for the type 1 diabetes and the CGM allows a trend in the blood glucose to be displayed over time that is the advantage over the traditional finger press finger prick testing and there is a calibration requirement in most of the CGM devices except in freestyle Libre you don't need the calibration the CGM usually detects the glucose from your interstitial fluid so it, time, it takes a time for the glucose to travel from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid so there is an in inherent lag behind this current blood glucose level so the lag could vary from five, uh, between 5 to 20 minutes it's based on the person and the device the CGM usually monitors uh, blood glucose continuously and transmits the blood glucose readings to a reader whereas in the case of a flash glucose monitor so um, we are using the flash glucose monitor here more than a CGM so uh, uh, that's the freestyle Libre it only transmits readings upon user interaction So these are the recommendations on frequency of blood glucose and ketone testing. In type 1 diabetes, if they are testing only 4 times a day, CGM is not required. They don't recommend, my test doesn't recommend. But if you are testing up to 10 times, you can consider it. And uh, these patients should commit to use this continuous glucose monitoring at least 70% of the time. And if there is calibration is needed, they should do that. In our trust, we usually provide the Libre. So if you are if you are regularly testing that, we will tell that they are Libre compliant. And also, if the patient needs more than ten times a day, in our trust it's eight almost, because of the patient's lifestyle, you know, driving drivers or high risk activities such as, and you need to do the ketone monitoring if there is illness in uh, in the in the type 1 diabetes patients in pregnancy they don't uh, advocate giving cgms to pregnant women with diabetes but if you have if you have severe problematic hypoglycemia with or without impaired awareness or who have unstable glucose levels that is market fluctuations you can try that In type 2 diabetes, there are no recommendations for type 2 diabetes. 
and if there is evidence of hypoglycemic episodes the patient is on medication with the risk of hypoglycemia like in case of drivers or operating machinery you can use it for a short term and also if the patient is on oral or intravenous corticosteroids but it is usually not done because it is not approved by the NHS as such so in type 2 diabetes CGMs are not recommended and CGMs will not be approved but the policy may change in the future now coming to the C, uh, Dexcom this is a continuous glucose monitoring here you apply you uh, apply the sensor on the back of your arm and then it is constantly being uploaded but the problem with Dexcom is that you need to calibrate every 12 hours with the finger stick this is the free trial library which is used in our trust so you apply the sensor on the back and it's a uh, it's easier to apply this sensor but you need to use the device bring it to the uh, sensor and scan it whenever you need it so you need to physically do that when you are using the freestyle library whereas in the Dexcom it will automatically send the data to the sensor to, to the machine so comparing uh, Libre with, uh, with Dexcom Libre is less accurate and it needs scanning it gives value only when asked but it's less expensive there are no alerts that is un one disadvantage but there is no calibration required and no uh, frequent finger sticks but the sensors fail more frequently and if the um, if the Libre values are going down then it will become less accurate so you need to do the finger sticks when it's going down and it cannot work with a closed loop whereas the Dexcom it is more accurate especially below 80 and 250 and it does not require scanning because it is constantly sending their data continuously records so it's a CGM whereas this is a FCGM that is a flash continuous glucose monitoring and uh, sorry flash glucose monitoring so this is a liberation FGM and Dexcom is a CGM and Dexcom is more expensive when compared with the Libre. It has got alerts and predictive uh, values whether the glucose is going up or down. And it can connect and uh, you know, sync with a closed loop. The Libre 2, which, is, uh, which we are expecting, could have this alert. So it could be more helpful when the Libre 2 comes. So this is another table which compares Freestyle Libre, Dexcom, G6 and Medtronic. So this is uh, an US table actually but in, uh, in, uh, in, in the UK I mean the warmer period is actually 2 hours. The advantage with uh, Libre is that calibration is required. Even though the Dexcom tells that it needs calibration that's what people are telling and Medtronic calibration is required and the Libre hasn't got any alarms whereas the Dexcom and the Medtronic has got the insertion for the Libre and Dexcom is easier I mean Libre is the easiest one in fact uh, the allergies the allergic incident I mean the allergy with the patches and all are less with Libre and uh, it sends glucose data when it is scanned and uh, Dexcom can send the data th to the smartphone whereas the Libre cannot do that. So coming to Diascent, what is Diascent? This is now a very popular system here in the UK and it, this is a system actually which uploads your blood glucose meter readings and displays them in a clear format to help pick up the patterns. You can also see how much insulin is being delivered. It also senses that. So it's very easy when you have a diacent because you can always see the out of target or unpredictable levels and thus we can help to improve the diabetes control. So here, here I have so, uh, shown you a um, CGM standard day. This is what the CGM looks like and these are uh, mid 50 percent 
and um, 90 percent uh, profile so uh, this is basically how your glucose goes through uh, and you can compare you know to what percentile level it has gone up or gone down and here you can see the statistics you know what was the median CGM value during this time and what is the average CGM value and how much of them is in the 25 percent quartile how much is in the 75 percent quartile etc and you can see this is the most beautiful part of the um, diacent in, in in a given week you can see how much of basal and how much of bolus you've taken in this case the basal is roughly around 30 percent i think and the bolus is 60 percent so that means that this patient is giving more boluses and uh, in addition to the basal rate so that means that the patient is having more glucose loads way more glycemic variability it could be due to his dietary pattern or it could be due to his work so ideally you need the basal and bolus 50 50 percent roughly in that area but here you can see that it's the boluses are more so that means that, that there is increased glycemic variability and it doesn't look like a good pattern so you can infer data from this this is pump data actually so um, you can you can see the balls is here on this day and on Saturday they, like it is comparing between Saturday and Sunday so Saturday they uh, he needed more balls is here Sunday it was less on Friday there was a huge ball is here coming and then on Thursday uh, the balls is were having this pattern so you can see how much balls is they are giving and especially on Saturday they might have a party or something like that so you can see the balls are an extended plus a standard balls and the balls are coming frequently that means there should be uh, increased glucose readings and that's why this patient was giving balls here but whereas on a Friday you can see that or, or on a Thursday you can see that the balls are fairly uniform Now there's a comparison logbook which we frequently use and we look at these values. The values show in red are above target and those in the uh, lilac are or violet color are below targets and those in greens are within targets. So you can very easily from this graph you know or from this table you can identify how much is out of range and how much is not. So it gives an idea from different angles actually. The the diacent and you can see typically in a day by day for example in this patient who is used 30 percent of bolus and sorry 30 percent of basal and 70 percent of the bolus you can see what exactly is happening for this patient you can see the blood glucose readings as uh, uploaded by your CGM and you can see the uh, the boluses that were given here Sorry, uh, sorry. You can see the uh, CGM data here and the balls that was given here. This is a glucose plot inferred from the CGM, and you can see how the insulin pump delivered the insulin. So you can see that the basals kept on creeping up when the sugar was going, and then you can see that the basals were lowered here, and even there was a uh, the basal was stopped here for a point, and then the basal was going on and you can see the bolus is given by this patient so you can e accurately see what the patient is doing with the pump and how um, his food intake and how the glycemic variability is going with them so we are more concerned about the glycemic variability so this helps in educating the parent how a patient how to change his basals and boluses and you know uh, that you could advise that the, drink, the working pattern or the eating pattern is not fairly good enough because of the glycemic variations and thus you could help the patient in 
changing his practices and then by changing the boluses and uh, changing the basils and ensuring a uh, more uh, yeah, a uniform pattern of glycemia throughout the day. This is also very very helpful uh, data from the diacent. So it is a compilation report actually. So it shows the average glucose per day. Average glucose, uh, okay, and it it shows the it it shows the CGM average also. So this has been. Uh, this is coming from the. This is coming from the CGM. This is coming from the finger prick, which they manually upload. And this is where you find the average. Uh, daily dose, and you can also you also input the carbs data so you can see the carbs how much carbs um, he's increasing using and you can see here how much percentage for this patient it was out of range see you can beautifully see it's almost around 60 percent and 41 uh, percent was in range And you can see the the basal and the basal used here and the bolus used here. So the average glucose is going above 11. Uh, from the CGM data, it's almost 10, uh, which is not very good. And when you see the fluctuations, it's uh, above 60 percent. It's going above. So that is not very good. We want to have this green color on this donut graph as far as we can to reduce the fluctuations and to reduce the um, hyperglycemic events. So these red ones are uh, hyperglycemic episodes. So, so as this green graph that is a euglycemia uh, is maintained, the boluses used can decrease. We, uh, we can decrease the boluses used and the basal will the basal to bolus ratio will come roughly to 50 50 to 50 50% 50 so that's what we ideally need now coming back to the endocrine society guidelines on cgm in adult hospital settings they recommend against the use of cgm in icus or an operating room where there is where you need more hours of operation like more than 2 hours in children and adolescents if their uh, HbA1c is less than 7 or 7, to uh, maintain target HbA1c level and to limit the risk of hypoglycemia, uh, we recommend that. So they usually recommend, um, they don't give any recommendation for children less than 8 years, but above 8 years, if their HbA1c even if it is less than seven, if they are having hypoglycemia, they they uh, they recommend that. And if their HbA1c is seven, but if they they can use these devices on a daily basis, they recommend it. Also, it can be uh, used in short-term retrospective studies, like with nocturnal hypoglycemia, dawn phenomenon, postprandial hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic unawareness. They uh, and also transitioning from the multiple daily in injection regime to the starting of a pump and all they recommend this but you need to remember that the treatment guidelines should be provided to all patients in a very clear and understanding way in adults if uh, the HbA1c levels are 7 or less than 7 and then if they can use it on a nearly daily basis the society recommends it and also the intermittent use of CGM could be benefited in patients with nocturnal hypo, dawn phenomenon, postprandial hypoglycemia, or and also it will help in the management of hypoglycemic awareness. Or when there are changes made in their diabetes regimen. In all these cases, the society is recommending CGMs. Thank you.